Hey, good morning to those of you out there on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you here on the East Coast. It's another great day here on the East Coast. It's sunny. Um, I'm not going out sailing today, but I'm sure going to go down to the boat and just look and make sure it's ready. Hey, I'd like to give a tip before we get started to those of you who show up early and on time as a thank you. Um, when you show up early and on time, LinkedIn is pushing it out to others and just letting them know, hey, we're getting started with the training. So thank you. My tip for today is um, I want you to understand the difference in the progression between implied needs and explicit needs. And this ties into, by the way, today's training, because um, uh, the reason we reach out to customers, and we do cold calls and have meetings is because we're trying to uh, talk to them about their needs so then we can align it to our solution. And so uh, when I teach people about sales, I talk about implied needs and explicit needs. And implied needs are needs that, yeah, you know, we may have it, et cetera. Um, an example is servers are running slow and emails running slow. The implied need is they need to refresh all that equipment. But the explicit need is uh, twofold. Either if it, if it crashes completely and they can't bring it up, well, they have a clear explicit need. I need to buy servers today. But the other one is um, our job as salespeople is before those servers crash is to help them see what would happen if it does crash. So if those servers are maintaining a uh, nuclear power plants or whatever, and they crash, then it's all unsecure and everything's going to go to uh, hell in a handbasket kind of thing, right? And so we we try to get our customers to go from implied to explicit needs. And the reason I'm giving you this as a tip is remember that people buy when they know they have an explicit need. They don't buy when they have implied need usually. And so the reason we ask questions is to get to explicit needs. And that's the reason we do cold calls is so we can get in and have meetings with customers and talk to them about those needs. So that was just a quick tip as a way to say thank you to those of you who show up uh, early and on time. I appreciate it. I think we're good here. Um, today seems like a popular topic out there because we got over uh, over 100 folks just um, registered and, and we're on multiple platforms. So I love seeing that because I try to find the topics that really resonate with you and, and what you want to see. Um, so let me go ahead and just make sure I got my ducks in a row here. and We're going to get started. Uh, hello to those of you in the chat. I, I don't look there too much at the moment. I'll look later, but I, I love the fact that you're in the chat talking because that is your community. So definitely engage with each other and talk um, in a way that's uh, positive always, right? Okay, so today's training, we're gonna talk about um, how I make cold calls to federal buyers. Cold calling is a really important part of um, business development and capture, so sales within the federal market. And I just wanted to align it to the seven step process that um, I teach people, right? So here's the seven step process. If you want sales, you need to be able to write winning proposals. In order to write winning proposals, you must have slam dunk opportunities. In order to identify slam dunk opportunities, you must have strategic relationships with buyers and teammates. And that begins from your effort of doing cold calls. So outreach is basically cold calls. And so today we're going to talk about targeting and outreach, mostly outreach as it relates to cold calling um, and getting into federal buyers. I'm not going to be talking about how to have the first meeting because once you're in the door, you kind of know what to do. For a lot of people, they they struggle, and this is the purpose of today's training. They struggle with getting in the door and um, and scheduling that meeting, that first meeting with a potential customer. So let me talk quickly about um, some top challenges that people might face and you might face when making cold calls. And actually, if any of these resonate with you, throw them in the chat. Let me know that. Um, yeah, that's me. You know, that one's that one's right on with me. So here's some, eight, you know, I have eight top challenges that I wrote down that relate to um, cold calling and, and what people sometimes feel. The first one is you just hate making cold calls. The, the whole idea, you're like, ah, I hate it. I don't want to do it. Um, you never know what to say, right? You're going to uh, pick up the phone, but you, you feel like you're going to be stumbling over your words. You don't know what to say out there. The third challenge that people have with making cold calls is... Um, that you'll find anything to do instead of making the call. And I call this constructive procrastination. You will do something that's really important, but not, not the thing you should be doing, right? You, you need to pick up the phone. And so you're always finding something else to do and you can rationalize why it's important to do that. Um, number four, you know, you spend a lot of time researching. I'm gonna do cold calls. Let me really research into that person. And I, if you've never heard me say this before, say never research anybody before you do cold calling. Um, the reason is what if they don't pick up the phone? What if they don't talk to you? You just spend all that time researching. That's why I like saying when you do cold calls, 
the purpose of the cold call is to schedule a meeting. It's not to have the meeting. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And if you know that the purpose is to schedule a meeting, not have the meeting, then you don't have to be prepared. In fact, you can say that to them, that the reason I'm scheduling it a week or two weeks out is so now I can go do more homework and use your time wisely. Um, but you tend to spend a lot of time doing researching and justifying that as needed before you would pick up the phone. Another challenge is um, you've had a bad experience with a caller before, and it's just puts you out of the dating game of business, right? You're like, oh my gosh, they were like, what are you calling me for? I'm not the right person. And they hung up. It's like, you know, that can throw us sometimes. I get it. But, um, you know, my goal today is to kind of help you get back on that bandwagon and forget about the bad experience because that's not going to be the only bad experience you have. Uh, number six, right? You wish there was an easier way. I too wish there was an easier way to make a million dollars, right? Instead of having to call somebody, schedule that first meeting, get in and have those first meetings, go through the process. But making a million dollars or a hundred million dollars is hard work. It's not hard. It's just a lot of work, right? You got to get out of bed, put your tennis shoes on and go to work. Um, number seven, you fear rejection. And this one, we'll talk more about this. You fear that if you call, they're just, it's not going to be a bad experience, but they're going to, no, no, no. And by the way, you're talking to a guy who sold vacuum cleaners door to door, 18 years old. I'm walking around with a vacuum cleaner, knocking on doors. You talk about rejection. Um, <laughs> there's fear of getting hurt there. There's no fear of me physically getting hurt when I pick up the phone. The worst thing can do is slam down the phone. Uh, and then the last one, number eight, is uh, you aren't having success. So maybe you are picking up the phone and you're making the phone calls, but you aren't having the success that you think you uh, should have or that you want to have. And these are some of the challenges that people face. Um, and again, one of the things I want to just put in your mind right now, because it's important to have your mindset before you move on to the calls, cold calling is not about making a sale. Cold calls is about making uh, scheduling a meeting. If you're doing capture, maybe cold calls is about getting a piece of information. What contract vehicle is this coming out of? Uh, when's the RFP expected to drop? Those are factual uh, pieces of information you're trying to get, but you're not trying to make a sale. Um, but in business development, when you're trying to get in and build relationships, you're not trying to make a sale. You're not even really talking about an opportunity. I'm here to learn more about your agency. And so if you lower the bar, your own expectations on yourself, you'll begin to understand that, hey, I don't have to go in there and knock it out of the park. I just have to show up at the ball field. I don't even have to get on the field yet. Just show up, you know, and um, that's a start. So if you understand this, that you're not the purpose of cold calls is not to make um, sales or to win sales, et cetera, but it's to get a meeting. Just put get the meeting into the chat. Let me know you're following along with what I'm saying. If you don't know who I am, by the way, my name is Neil McDonald. I'm the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you to my daily federal sales training where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years as a small business owner in the federal market. And since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. When you follow the process A to Z, you're going to have predictable, repeatable results. Um, before we get started, do me a favor, help buyers. If you haven't done this already, remember who you are. Put your company name and your core competency, two or three words, into the chat. Let us know and let us remember um, who you are and what your company sells. Finally, I wanted to say thank you to uh, our sustaining members. We don't take any federal dollars. We don't take any money uh, as sponsors from large prime contractors. Uh, sustaining members like you are the ones who make this training possible for all small businesses out there. And we just wanted to say thank you. Uh, today's training is actually a summary of a cold calling course that's in the membership. So if you're a member, go take a look at that because this is just touching on cold calling, but I have a whole course in there that I think you'd enjoy. Um, okay. So I'm going to be talking at a fire hose pace. I want to get a lot of good information to you and I have a very limited amount of time, 20 more minutes, right? And, uh, but I want to make sure it drives home some really good tips for you. Um, so the first thing I just want to point out is that if you're one of those people on the cold calling side who are really afraid and you're scared, um, I'm not going to get rid of that fear. I'm not going to get rid of that anxiety, but I am, I am going to teach you um, how to reduce it, how to reduce it to the point where you're effective. I used to jump out of airplanes when I was an army ranger and someone asked me once, it's like, hey, you know, are you scared when you do this? Of course I'm scared. I'm jumping out of a plane a you know, bazillion miles in the air, going a bazillion miles an hour. Um, of course I'm scared. But by learning the process of leaving an airplane and landing safely on the ground and then um, continuing to improve those skills, my fear was reduced. It was reduced to this point where by practicing those skills, I could jump out of an airplane without hesitation over and over again, right? Yes, I was scared because it's logical to be a little scared or anxious jumping out of a plane, 
but I didn't hesitate to do it. And um, it, so it's important for you to understand that the same thing can happen to you. I'm here to teach you the process and some skills about cold calling. And when you follow the process, develop those skills through experience repetition, right? Your anxiety is gonna go down. You, you will be able to make these cold calls without hesitation. And so if you're fearful of it, don't worry about it. Um, I got you covered. You'll be able to jump out of airplanes. In fact, do me a favor, put airborne down in the chat if you understand that you can get over your fear and anxiety by just learning the process and developing the skills. Airborne. Um, Okay, so uh, one of the biggest things holding us back from making calls is the fear of rejection. And one of the things I wanted to talk about is that you will be rejected. I teach people that uh, you know when you're making calls, some will, some won't, so what? Some people will do what you want, will pick up the phone, will talk to you. Some people will, some people won't, so what? Don't worry about the other stuff, right? You're going to be rejected. It's not personal, it's just a fact. Um, in fact, speaking of facts, let me show you this one graphic that I use. It's an adoption bell curve. And this, this goes into what I'm saying. If you look at the left-hand side, 2.5% of the people you call are going to pick up the phone and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe you called me. I've been waiting for somebody like you, a company like yours to call me, right? That's 2.5%. Uh, We're going to be excited, right? And then 13.5%, um, they're going to be excited, but they'll say, hey, I'm busy. Let's talk tomorrow. And then this early majority is going to be the people who say, well, who else have you talked to within my agency? Well, I talked with John and I talked with Sally. Oh, sounds good. Let's talk. And so that early majority, that 34 percent, those people are just looking for a little bit of uh, social proof or borrowed credibility from somebody else you might have talked to that they trust. Um, doesn't mean they won't talk to you. They're just going to talk to you a little later. But if you look on the right hand side, the late majority is only going to talk to you if they have to. And the laggards will never talk to you. So 16%, 16 out of 100 people you call and who you reach are not going to talk to you. You can also think about this. Who's going to answer your phone? 50% of them are going to answer the phone and 50% will not. And it's really important for you to understand that because some will, some won't. So what, right? It's a numbers game. You just have to call enough people. When we do our workshop, we make sure that um, our customers have a list of 200 people to call because when you have that many, you're going to find, the, find those five or 10 or 20 people who are just spot on for your company. Um, okay, so if you get that and you understand the idea that some will, some won't, so what? Put some will in the chat. Just let me know that you're tracking on what I'm teaching and the speed I'm teaching is not too, too fast out there. Um, I want to walk you through now. So I was blowing through that pretty fast in the first 15 minutes because I wanted to leave enough time to talk about the process, right? Um, and what's the process I follow to make cold calls to federal buyers? This, and I've been doing cold calls forever, uh, 30 years kind of thing, right? right? Even though I look 30 myself, um, I've been doing cold calls a long time and they evolve over the time. But the beautiful part about the federal market is that you are not trying to make a sale. You're just trying to reach out and set up a meeting. And when you know that, then um, the activity you're doing is incremental. That's why we say in the federal market, right, it takes six to 24 months to land a, a contract, especially the bigger the contract you go after. And so you don't have to do everything today. You just have to make sure you know what you want to get done and get it done slowly. And meetings, cold calls are like that as well. So the first step in the process, when I'm going to do cold calling and I'm working with you and we're going to make cold calls, I'm going to say, pick one agency. You need to focus on one agency. Um, it doesn't matter if other agencies call you, you can pick up the phone. That's great. You know, that's reactive sales, but proactive sales, you want to pick one agency, the Air Force, Department of Education, NASA, whoever it is, right? Pick one agency and focus your efforts for outreach. This is outbound sales, if you will. You're, you're calling to the, uh, to the customer to try to get them to take your call and take a meeting with you, but you want to pick one agency. Who's your agency? In the chat, put your agency. Right? Let me know if you actually can sit there and, and just put one agency into the chat or whether you end up putting three. Right, One agency. And by the way, no one's allowed to pick HHS or uh, DOD. Those are too big. Pick an agency below that. Same thing with DHS. One level below if you can. Um, okay. So the first thing is pick an agency. The second thing you're doing, because now you pick the agency, is you're going to build a target list. Remember I said that you want to build a list of one or 200 people in there. And so... Um, when you're building a target list, this is basically a spreadsheet with a bunch of names, emails, and phone numbers. Do not put them into your CRM tool is my recommendation 
until you actually call them and talk to them. Otherwise, you're just putting junk into your CRM tool, right? But if you dump it into a spreadsheet, the people you get traction with, um, you can put it over into the CRM tool. It's up to you on what to do. But I always feel like CRM tools slow down the cold calling activity. But when you're building your list, I want you to think about people falling into one of three categories or groups of people. They can be a focus of receptivity, which means that they're receptive to talking to you about their agency. They're willing to make introductions to other people, right? They don't actually have a problem that you can solve and they don't have the power to award you a contract, but they are willing to talk with you. So those are called focuses of receptivity. Um, the second group of people are called focuses of dissatisfaction. In the federal market, this is basically the program office, the people with the actual need that your product or solution can solve. Third group is focus of power. This is the contracting officer and other acquisition related people. So those three groups, when you look into an agency and you're building your target list, 100, 200 people, you wanna make sure you've got a sufficient amount of focuses of receptivity, a sufficient amount of focuses of dissatisfaction and a sufficient amount of focuses of power. Um, one of the things you can keep in mind actually to get started if you haven't started, today's the day I share a bunch of graphs apparently. Um, right here, go to govconchamber.com and you can find my small business specialist directory, our small business specialist directory, because a lot of us have been putting that together. Um, but this directory has over a thousand names, numbers, and emails of um, focuses of receptivity within the federal market. So within agencies, the Navy, for example, we got like 150 people in there. In addition, we also have over a hundred large prime contractors uh, with Focus is a receptivity in there. Generally, those are SBLOs, small business liaison officers, but those are in a large prime contractor. Those are the you know, kind of your first focus of receptivity. So you want to go um, download that directory from our website if you haven't done it already. Actually, just so you know, when you download it, you're on our list so we can let you know about a new update. We'll be updating the directory again uh, next week, probably because we got a lot of um, updates in the past month. Okay, one last thing on, uh, so I was talking about target list. As you move forward, one thing that's unique to focuses of uh, dissatisfaction, these program office people, is before you do any cold calling to them, I treat them differently and I would warm them up. And so an example of warming them up is you can go out onto LinkedIn and engage with them on content. And I'm just using somebody who I've been seeing on my radar for the past couple of weeks and who I've interacted a little bit with, but the DOD CIO. So if you're in, in that space, first off, only do it, only contact a person like that if you're doing 20 million or more or something, right? But I'm just using it as an example because any one of his direct reports, but he's on LinkedIn and he's posting content, he's engaging on other content. And so before I would ever reach out to a CIO uh, at you know DOD or IRS or wherever, I would get out there and I would engage with them for weeks, two, three, four, eight weeks, however long it takes, depending on how much I wanna make sure they're aware of who I am before I call. Um, and on LinkedIn, if I get engaged, and, and this guy was posting content over the weekend too. So your ability to track people like this and engage with their comments or their content by giving them a thumbs up or uh, writing a relevant comment uh, he was, one guy was writing, uh, this this DOD CIO was writing a, con uh, a post about um, the idea of you always have to be up with energy for your employees and your direct reports. You can't bring your demotivation to them or it just runs downhill. And, um, you know, if you've experienced that before, that's, that's something where you can pop in and say, oh, such a good point. And he wrote like six paragraphs. So finding something relevant is good. My point about engaging these focuses of dissatisfaction is you can start with just basic engagement and then eventually if it makes sense you can begin to pull them into some of your content an example is if you're a zero trust company and you say hey top 10 uh, or top 10 pieces of advice for for getting a zero architecture in place or whatever right and you've just got 10 10 tips you can tag that person that you're trying to reach and maybe they'll value it if it's the right person they will value it so anyways you're warming up those focuses of dissatisfaction is part of the process. So let me back this up one second. First step is to pick an agency. Second step is to build that target list. Third step, just for focuses of dissatisfaction, is warm them up on LinkedIn. And now the uh, fourth step is to create reusable um, tools, right? So create voicemail scripts, email templates, a call plan template, um, all this stuff I've described in other training. It's part of that cold calling course I mentioned. But the idea is, for example, with a voicemail script, you don't want to go in and, and 
uh, leave a voicemail that's different every single time. You want it to be following an exact script. And that script is, hey, this is Neil McDonald. I'm calling from GovCon Chamber of Commerce and uh, it's just trying to get on your schedule, whatever. I have a better voicemail script somewhere else. You know, but it's an exact script, 30 seconds, right? You don't want it to go too much longer. It's got the phone number at the beginning at the end. And the whole point of it is to get on their radar. Um, it's vital that you leave a voicemail and follow up with an email. If you are the right person to talk to them, then you don't have to worry about them rejecting you. They might be too busy to take your call. It might take a while to get to them, but it's only wrong if you're uh, you know, not making any money in the government space and you call that DOD CIO. You're wasting his time, right? You're wasting actually the small business specialist's time, just as a side note, if you call them and you haven't looked at their website, right? And so there's these, um, the idea of a voicemail script is you're getting on the radar, you're letting them know who you are. The um, email template, and I'll talk about that in a second, is making sure you're following a standard plan. You still personalize it to the people you're reaching out to, but you want a template. Um, and then a call plan, if you haven't heard me do this training, a call plan is, you know, when you go into a meeting, you want to make sure you have uh, a standard set of questions and objectives that you have so that your meetings will be successful. That's a different training than this one, but um, those three those three templates or, or tools you want to have in place, voicemail script, email um, templates, and call plan template. All right, so that was number four. Number five is the actual outreach process with four steps in there. Um, so this is picking up the phone. I call it dialing for dollars. So I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call a bunch of people. And my first piece of guidance for you is make sure you've got at least 25 names and numbers in front of you. And that's who you're going to call. You're going to sit down for an hour or whatever amount of time. You're going to sit down, pick up the phone, and call them. Rarely will they pick up the phone. If they pick up the phone, that's great. You can sit there and basically use the voicemail script as a way to just talk to them. You know, hey, John, thanks for taking the call. I was just calling to try to get on your schedule next week or the week after. You know, I have a whole uh, tips on how to do that better. But the idea is most people will not pick up the phone. And so you can leave this voicemail. So you want to make sure you're calling 25 people in a row. And with each one of them, you leave this 30 second um, voicemail. And so you could do this pretty quickly, right? 30 minutes or less almost um, as you move forward. So the first step is to call them all, call 25 people. Second one is to leave that voicemail. The third step as you move forward is you want to follow up with an email. So I just left a voicemail saying, hey, John, I want to schedule a meeting with you. Two hours later, right? Not right away, but like two hours later, I send a follow-up email and it says in the subject line, right? Uh, voicemail follow-up. Hey, John, I just left you a voicemail. I just wanted to uh, reach out, see if I could get on your schedule next week, or the week after. In fact, when I send an email, I typically put two dates and times. Like if you're available Thursday or Tuesday or Thursday at 10 a.m. or 2 p.m., um, that would work perfect for me next week or the week after. Something like that, right? You're trying to give the person you want to meet with choices so they pick a choice instead of uh, you know, saying, hey, what do you want for dinner? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm hungry for. Forget that. Sit there and say, do you want this or this, right? Do you want chicken, fish, or, or beef? Um, so you want to follow up with an email two, uh, two hours after you left a voicemail. And what you're doing now is the people you called and they listen to your voicemail, then they see the email, they're beginning to know you. I know that this person, Neil, is reaching out and trying to have a meeting, et cetera. And then the last step in this process, and this is a kind of a broader uh, process, is you want to be able to follow up uh, two times a week. I get this question asked a lot about, um, you know, hey, I, I don't get responses back. Okay, well, how often do you call? In fact, this, this happens to me where people reach out to me, even I might even see it and go, oh, I got to get back to that person. And then I don't. And, and an hour goes by and 20 emails come in. A day goes by and 200 emails come in. Um, I'm not rejecting that person. What I like to say is the answer is always yes, I will meet with you until I say no, I will not meet with you. And the federal buyers are the same. Their answer is yes until they say no. The problem is they're just like you and me where their days get busy, the voicemail gets buried, the emails get buried, they forget. They do not mean it in any bad way. Uh, and often I see people sit there and say, oh my God, I'm so glad you called me back because uh, I wanted to follow up and then I got caught up and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter why they got caught up. We're all busy. Um, as salespeople, people doing cold calls, we just have to be willing to follow up. And so what I find that is a challenge for people doing cold calls is that follow-up. They don't do it. They think they do it. And when I ask questions about, well, 
How often are you following back up with them? I don't know, every couple of weeks? No. <laughs> every couple of days. If it goes longer than 24 hours, I've already forgotten about you. So what I say is don't go longer than 48 hours, 72 hours before you follow up. Um, I have a 30-day step, and it's a whole separate training that I did, but 30 days of just following up with somebody who hasn't gotten back to you yet. How often should I call them? You should call them constantly. Don't bug them. Don't be unprofessional, but you should follow up. You should send a, um, a voicemail, an email. A couple of days later, you can follow back up. Hey, just getting on your radar. You wait till the next Monday. You say, hey, just surfacing this to the top of your inbox. You're just following up. You're not being pushy or anything. How come you're not, how come you're not taking my calls or whatever? Forget about all that. Just follow up the same way you would want somebody to follow up with you who you're not opposed to talking with. You just haven't got back to them. Um, and so in the 30 day process, I talk about ways you can follow up. One way is with a, a phone call. So you pick up the call, your phone and, and you call them. So you should do that once a week, every week until you get to them. If you want to talk with them, follow up. And then emails once a week, every week. So you're doing at least two touches a week minimum. Then if you can find them on LinkedIn, I would engage them on LinkedIn and not heavily, but you can do this thing where you're just in there, give them a thumbs up and you're on the radar. You don't pester them on LinkedIn because sometimes people over there just want to deal with content, not scheduling meetings. Um, but you could also just follow up and um, engage with them on LinkedIn in a way where you, you like their stuff, you comment on their stuff, you follow their profile. LinkedIn will tell them that, hey, Neil just followed your profile. When you do this and you constantly are going after somebody, you'll be able to get that meeting, right? And it just depends on how fast you want to get it. Focuses of um, receptivity, you typically can get those meetings and the responses fairly quickly. Focuses of dissatisfaction, it might take them a little while because their job is not to talk with you. And so they'll want to make time to talk with you so they can learn about it, et cetera. So anyways, keep in mind that process um, as you move forward, just saying it again, call 25 people in a row, leave the voicemail, two hours later, follow up with an email, and then follow a 30-day, what we call a drip campaign, but manual, you're doing it on purpose. Uh, follow up with a 30-day touching, uh, you're reaching back to that customer over and over again until you get them to say yes, or they say no, no's fine too. Remember, some will, some won't, so what? So this is a process for reaching out and uh, making calls. I do have that handout, um, it's available, I think, on our website, um, but this is all just laying out the process for making a cold call. There's separate training on how do you actually have the meeting. So if you understand what I'm saying there, put process rocks. If you believe that if you follow a process, you will start making, um, having more success at making cold calls, just put process rocks into the chat. Um, what I just taught you here is exactly what I teach my customers in the BD Accelerator Workshop, right? We start off by making sure they're attracted to federal buyers and teammates, um, then helping them implement a strategic uh, federal marketing campaign. Um, and then by following a process, right, we help them build strategic relationships with buyers and teammates. You'll use the cold calling tips that I just shared today um, as your plan, as part of your plan to do outreach and, and to exercise your outreach efforts um, towards your target agency, right? What I'm looking forward to going back and see. So keep in mind, the people you're calling at your target agency, they want to meet qualified small businesses. They want to take your call. Just remember on the focusing on that idea that some will, some won't. So what? Just be persistent and they'll come back to you. So, hey, if you want to learn about my BD Accelerator workshop, ping me on LinkedIn, send me a message over there. And remember, government contracting, it is not a secret. It's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.